Miss Urvashi Butalia, for more than 40 years you have been working as a publisher of books and texts that are addressing feminist issues. Your book, The Other Side of Silence, is meanwhile being used as a text in some Indian universities and is uh, one of the most famous books in this field. How have your concerns as a feminist publisher changed over the years? Well, actually, my concerns as a feminist publisher have only expanded um, in the sense that uh, it, when we started doing feminist publishing in 1984, nearly, well, how long ago, over 30 years ago now, um, we were trying very hard to reflect what was going on in the women's movement and to create a kind of knowledge base for the movement in India so that we could understand the questions we were dealing with. 30 years later, those questions are much more complicated and uh, we are, of course, still trying to understand them and do the same thing of creating a knowledge base. But also, I think we're trying to bring in voices of women on the margins uh, to into the kind of publishing we do to address different communities such as children, such as young adults, such as the state, such as corporates and others, so that there is an understanding of what's happening with women and how they can work with them. So in a sense, the concerns, the core concerns are still the same, but there's been quite a lot of expansion also. India's anti-rape movement within the rapidly modernizing society brought multiple contexts of gender-based violence into the public discussion and on the political table. Rape is still the fourth most common crime against women in India. What has changed in the last year since the anti-rape movement started? I think a lot has changed and this anti-rape movement is actually the second wave of um, a movement that started in the 80s when in 1983 we achieved the first change in the law on rape. Uh, as a result of this recent movement, one of the interesting things that has happened is that more and more young men are becoming involved in the campaign against sexual violence, uh, especially sexual violence on women, that the attention of the media remains focused on this because women's groups have not allowed the issue to go away, they have kept it alive, that the issue is not only that of the rape of this young woman in Delhi, but much beyond that, the more silenced aspects of caste rape, of the rape uh, exercised by the army, all of these things are being brought into the dialogue. Inside places like Delhi, and I can only really speak for that, uh, in schools, in colleges, inside families, sexual violence is no longer a taboo subject. It is being talked about everywhere, Schools are organizing meetings and discussions on it. And somewhere there is a way in which the, the conversations around sexual violence are changing. But having said that, having said that, we have a new law which is having some good effects and some very negative, always when a new law comes in. Um, the new law still needs quite a lot of reform and uh, marital rape, for example, still needs to be included in it, which has not been the case. And uh, there is still a lot more to be done. The conversations, the changes that we are seeing are limited. Our politicians, for example, are still making terrible anti-women statements, getting away with them a lot of the time and not seeing anything wrong with those statements. Until that kind of thing starts to change, I don't think we'll see real change. Do you see a change after the elections that India's slow and overburdened, underfunded criminal justice system will deal differently with the plight of rape and sexual assault with victims? I don't think the elections have anything to do with it. I don't see a change after the elections. It's quite interesting that in the lead up to the elections, particularly for the Narendra Modi election campaign, uh, the question of women and women voters and women's security was made a big election plank. 
However, uh, subsequently, nothing's really happened to instill any confidence uh, in women that this government is going to deal differently with women than the previous government did. Uh, many of its MPs and many of the members of parliament of other governments, for example, Bengal, but also the ruling party in Delhi, have made strong anti-women statements. Uh, our prime minister has been quite silent on those. He himself has spoken about women on the Independence Day when he made a speech and talked about women's safety and security and the need for public toilets and so on and so forth. But all of it was couched in a protectionist mode that our women need to be protected, our sisters, our mothers and so on need to be looked after because only then will India be a better place. In my view, this has to be a discourse of rights. It cannot be something that says we need to protect our women. You need to recognize that your women are equal citizens of this country and you need to give them the rights that they deserve to have. And until politicians start recognizing that and speaking that language, I will not trust what they say at all. The rising profile and gradual mobility seems to interfere with many in India's upper caste communities who find it difficult to accept uplifted communities as equal. Also, the discrimination within the family breeds violence across society against women. What are the challenges and chances for the future that you see? You know, I think there are many challenges. Uh, I think that what is happening in India is a situation of tremendous change and tremendous flux. Um, First of all, India is not generally seen as a country of conflict because it is so large and by and large it is stable. But it's important to remember that at the two extremes of India, that is Kashmir and the Northeast, we have had an ongoing conflict, anti-state conflict for many, many years in which women become the targets of violence in very different ways from the everyday violence that they may face in within quotes the non-conflict areas and here they are largely targeted targeted by the army which is protected by a different law and then they are targeted by the militants which is something that does not get spoken about in communities because communities do not wish to admit that their own boys who are joining militancy are also targeting women. So there is something there that needs to be looked at in a very particular way. Then in much of urban India, you are getting a lot of change as the city is spreading into the village and villages are migrating into cities in search for a, of a better life, as happened with the young uh, victim of the December 2012 rape case. This, and they are aspiring, many young men and women are aspiring to change their lives. Also, whereas earlier in Indian society, which is not a permissive society in male-female relations, there was no possibility for young people to meet and socialize. Now you see it as possible in cities at least with the shopping mall and other spaces where young people can go out and meet and talk to each other and get to know each other. So there is a flux and a change happening there. There are jobs that are coming up as India becomes more and more of an outsourcing center, as a center for business processing, for information technology, new kinds of jobs into which lower middle class women are moving. And suddenly they are accessing the public world and they are threatening to men. There is a way in which village level politics is drawing lower caste, untouchable Dalit women into strong politics and strong positions of power, especially after the reservations in village and municipal level elections have come in in 1992. And therefore, suddenly Dalit women are accessing power and they are very threatening. Women are entering the political space, they're very threatening. So there is a lot of sexual violence being exercised against women by upper caste, by men who feel threatened, uh, to, in a sense, to control them or keep them in their place. And that, I think, is really the result of the changes that we are going through in India, in Indian society. 
women in India face myriad cultural challenges that impede social advancement, discriminatory family codes, lack of education, cultural stigmas, literacy, child marriage and violence. Could you please tell us something about the work and projects of women's groups and feminist groups in India? Now, there are Indian women's groups across India who are working on very, very different areas at different levels and scales. So you have, for example, the women's wings of political parties who are basically working to advance the agenda of those political parties. So let's say the women's wing of the Communist Party of India Marxist would be working in the field of labor relations, would be working in the field of uh, right to housing, would be working in the field of caste and so on. Uh, if you have women, uh, the women's wing of say the right wing BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, they would be working in a completely different area altogether to make women into good wives, to make women into good Hindus and so on. So it's important to recognize that you have that extremes extreme variation. Women's groups across the country work with um, women in the workplace, they work on violence against women, they work on education and literacy, and they work on uh, women in corporate environments. There's a huge number of women involved in the anti-nuclear protests, there's a huge number of women involved in the protests against genetically manufactured foods, there is lot of women involved in their protests against the building of big dams. So it's very difficult to pinpoint one because there are women's groups and NGOs who focus on women. There are broad political movements in which women are key characters and key participants and which in fact in many of them they are leaders. So you get and then there are political parties who have their women's wings who are doing something completely different. You get a mix of this. How can feminists in India articulate their concerns? See, I don't think feminists in India have any problem about articulating their concerns. We are very, very articulate. We are very um, strongly uh, speaking out of, about our concerns. And when I say we, I don't mean people only like me who are urban, uh, educated, privileged, uh, upper class, that kind of thing. But I do not know uh, many Indian women involved in the feminist movement, whether they are poor or from villages or Dalit or anything, who are not able to speak out quite strongly about their concerns. You know, I think you give women a chance and give them the possibility to speak and they will speak. Uh, a long ago, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, who's a very well-known academic in the United States, asked this question and said, can the subaltern speak? But in India, the subaltern woman is speaking all the time and speaking really strongly about her concerns. So I don't have any worries on that count at all. What do you expect from civil society organizations to do so that the remaining battles can be won? I think civil society organizations have to continue to fight on many fronts. And in some ways what happens is that um, in a democracy you sort of take the democratic rights for granted and you don't realize how important it is to continually keep the battle up. I think we are realizing in India now, after the elections, that uh, many of the freedoms we took for granted are beginning to be threatened. Censorship is one of them, which we were quite, you know, okay, we have a free press, we have the right to say what we want, etc. Now, when we are finding more and more barriers on the sort of things we want to say, uh, it is quite worrying. And I think that we might need to wake up more and realize exactly how much of what we have fought for is threatened and how much stronger the fight has to be uh, to, to re uh, maintain the, the victories that we have had and to move forward. 
And that has got to be a civil society battle. It has to be. What are your hopes and wishes for the future? Oh, I think, well, <laughs> difficult to say, but I, I mean, I would hope that India will one day be um, the sort of gender inclusive society that, that we have all dreamt of uh, making it. Uh, and I have no doubt that it will be. I, it is only a matter of time, but I don't think the path will be linear. You know, you will not always keep moving forward. I think the path will be a difficult path with obstacles, but it will, we will get there finally. So my hope is just that we get there quickly, but I know also I'm a realist. I know that we won't get there very quickly, but uh, we will get there. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.